Good to have everybody here today. I like May. You like the warmer? It's good. We're going to have a good time here this morning. Try this together with me this morning. We praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love. For Jesus soon died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, the glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior. Scattered our night, hallelujah, the glory, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. these words. Is our rescuer, is our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. Do you like that chorus? Why don't we try it again? Is our rescuer, is our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive, good news for the saint, there's good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed, for the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord our rescuer. Is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor, it's friendship for the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. Oh, the good Lord is a way, the truth, the life. Yes, the good Lord is a way, the truth, the life. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer. We are free from 
seat this morning. Good job. Aren't you grateful that we have a rescuer in Jesus? Amen. Love the words to this song. Lover of our souls. Yeah. Goes like this. Jesus, you're the lover of my soul. Jesus, never let you go. Taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock and oh, I love you, I need you, though my world will never let you go. You're my savior, my closest friend. I will worship. Till the very end, sing, I love you. I love you, Lord. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. You're my Savior, my closest friend. I will worship you until the very end. Sing it again from the top, we say. Jesus, the lover of my soul. Jesus, oh, I'll never let you go. Taking me from the mighty clay. You set my feet upon the rock. I'll never let you go. You're my savior, my closest friend. I will worship you until the very end. One more time, sing, I love you. I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. You're my savior, my closest friend. I will worship you until the very end. Lord, thank you for this morning. Just thank you for this place where we can come. The end of a busy week, start of a new one. Lord, just to quiet our hearts for a few moments and be in your presence. So grateful that you are the lover of our soul. So grateful today, Lord, that we can fellowship with you, not just here today on a Sunday, but Lord, you're a friend who never leaves, you never forsake. So Lord, this week, no matter what the week brings, you're right there all the time, all the time. Lord, we give you the thanks, we give you the praise this morning for this morning that we have, just to clear our hearts, clear our minds for a few moments and just receive from you today. Thank you for our pastor today. Thank you for the word he's about to bring. Just fill us up with more of you before we leave here today, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The other day we got a text. We get a few of those texts. Some I've re I'd rather not have, Tommy, you know. Then there's those other texts that just come in the nick of time, right? 
you pick them up and there it is on the other side. And the, the cool thing about a text, you know, you can you can send a picture, you can send a video, you can send a you can send a song. Well, the other day I got this text from Tyler and it was a song. And it was him and Elizabeth. You know, Elizabeth, she's two. She's cool. And uh, before she goes to bed at night, she likes to sing a song. So they've been working on one. And we're going to sing it right now. But this is a song I grew up listening to many Sundays. And my dad would sing it. And my mom would throw in a harmony with him. They got a pretty special harmony going on this, uh, this text I got the other day. But so precious that she's singing the words. And it starts out the first verse. It says, um, I come to the garden alone. Wow. Heard her singing that the other day. I thought, wow. That's in your book, in the garden. I know we got the words on the screen. You can take them off the screen. But pick up your book with me for just a minute today, would you? Something special about the book, and I don't know what page it's on. Somebody have to help me. What, what page is it? 428. I love all the new songs. We love all the old ones. We do them all, right? We do them all. 428. But there's something special about that book you're holding in your hand today. And haven't we just come through a, <laughs> an amazing season in our life? Haven't we? Still going through it? God's bringing us through. I just wonder how many people have been in this church over the years, and they've held that book you're holding in your hand right now, and they were going through a time where God met them. Somehow we're connected to them when we sing the songs. Isn't that neat? Isn't that awesome? You can get connected to folks through a, through a recipe. How many of you guys got a good old recipe you got from Grandma? Somewhere, and you have that meal, and there you're enjoying that, and you're thinking of all the times, right? But here we are with another memory, if you will, growing up perhaps in church. Mike listening to Dad sing a song like this one. And now another generation that's coming along behind that, that are learning the same words. Right now they're just words, maybe for Elizabeth. She's just two, but one day they'll mean a lot more. Try this together with us this morning. I come to the garden alone While the two is still on the road And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there He speaks and the sound of his voice he is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave. the night. 
night around me before but he bids me go through the voice his voice to me is talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there and as there is the joy we share and the joy we share as we tarry there, none has We are still in the book of Romans, going through it week by week. We are in chapter 8. At this point, we are in verse 18 through 30. That's the remainder of the chapter. I'm going to just trust that you will somehow, some way on your own, read through the book and then read through the book and then read through the book and read through the book. Okay? So we don't lose the flow. Now, actually, the material we're covering today could very, very easily be 10 weeks by itself because there are some key passages here, and each one could stand alone as a topic, but all of them go together under the topic of the future glory and hope of the saints. What's the outcome? Here's what I think I see happening among the church today in many quarters. Because of some of the very questionable teaching out there, there are many of God's people who are living for this world and not for the world to come. And they're getting caught up in the wrong things. And the first big measure of that and proof to me was the outcome of the presidential election. Many believers went off the cliff and never recovered. And they said, but God told me, but God showed us, but that's what's supposed to happen, uh, which means they have not studied presidential elections during the entirety of our own history, or you would see this more than once. It is different in that we are a much larger co country, twice the population of the day I was born, twice the population. And most of that growth is immigration, not born here. It's coming. So our whole culture has changed dramatically and pushed more toward a globalist agenda, which seeks at its secular view, uh, there is no God, so why worry about it? If we don't start getting our heads together and planning together and save the planet, everything is going to, and that'll be it. The minute you throw God out of the equation, you're in trouble. And that has happened. So what is happening then in the minds of many believers is we are measuring eternity in the view of where we are right now. And that's a big mistake. Are you the same person you were 20 years ago? Except for those of you under 20. Okay. You're not. Have you been through battles that you never thought you'd ever go through? Have you seen things you never thought you would see in your lifetime? Because we had our preconceived, um, is that an amen back there? <laughs> you pinching that poor little kiddo. <laughs> now, at the appropriate time, okay. <laughs> A lot of people got stuck in uh, Beaver Cleaver's house and they just assumed, you know, and then other people got stuck in a more modern version and all of the old standards have been thrown out the window. And both of them are a risky place to be in the end. We as God's people have a future hope 
in future glory. The way it's being defined today is glory, and we looked at last year, we are heirs with Christ, our inheritance. It, it keeps being looked at as though it is worldly, and therefore I'm God's child, and I prayed, and he's got to answer it that way. No, that would be brats talking and not understanding who they're talking to and demanding and commanding and all this other stuff that goes with it. And so when if, if I just took that title, Future Glory, and said, okay, before we even look at this and read this, what does that mean to you? Inevitably, and I'm not saying you in particular, Christians in general, some would say, well, I'm, I'm waiting for my mansion in heaven. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> I crossed my eyes at the appropriate time. Well, I can't wait for future glory because I'm going to see grandma and grandpa and all my kinfolk, and, uh, and then some of you are going, oh, my God, I'm going to see all my exes, and I don't know how that's <laughs> going to work out. And you, so you have to reel it back in, and I'm going to see my dog spot and my pet turtle and whatever. No, that's not what, that's not it at all. I think somehow in that mix there may be a, very fleeting moment that we will recognize in our spirit that lost people are gone. And that will be the end of it. We won't ever think about it again. We won't have to deal with it again. And then we'll have the wake-up call of, look who's here that belongs to Christ. It will be an equal surprise, except that group we have eternity to live with and grow with. So how we define eternity, when you start defining eternity in earthly terms, no matter what, you're going to get stuck in a rut. You're going to get stuck in a, in a, in a repetitive, it's going to be like Groundhog Day forever, okay? Referring back to the old movie, those of you who know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and you do a rerun over and over and over. That's not it at all. And we ended last week that part of our hope and inheritance in this world is to suffer. And that's not being taught either. It's, I got a pain and I'm praying for God to take it away. And we start cutting deals, you know, with God. If you And that was my conversation with Billy several years back. You know, I, I woke up and realized God was still there in my life. And so I started telling him all the stuff I'm going to do if he will take care of me. And I said, retract everything you've said. You're not going to do it anyway. How about if you come and learn to love God's people and God's people learn to love you? How, how about that instead? And he got it. Okay, now right now, before we get to that first slide, because I've had this converse, I have this conversation probably a hundred times a year with people and myself. When I see God's people, do I see a holy people? a sanctified people, a victorious people, and I'm doing it in terms of this world, and I'm going, we are a train wreck, folks. That's what we really are. And out of that came the whole concept of what you have on your bulletin. This has to be a healing place because that's where I came from. That's where Stan came from. That's where you came from. We are all in the same boat. We're broken, and we need to be put back together. Not for the sake of this time and space only, but for the sake of eternity. Okay, now we're ready to take some notes. Let's look at this first part. The future glory of Christ within will be revealed to all, but not necessarily in this lifetime. Have you seen children of God who have failed miserably in one of any major areas of life? Of course. In fact, that's probably you. It's me. We fail. So we're talking about the future glory of the Christ who lives within us already. There will come a time, not in this world, but at the end of this world and the beginning of eternity in the world, new heavens, new earth, it will be revealed to all. And I think that includes the angels who are waiting to see what all of this exactly means. 
for us. I think it will uh, invariably uh, include the entirety of nation, uh, of, of the world, because this world is broken and fallen, and yet we still see the beauty of God even amidst the struggle, and on and on. So what all that means, even making that statement, I have to be very clear. I don't know what I'm talking about because it's too big. God has a revelation, a revealing of all of history at one point in time. I'm going to show you what I've always been doing. My children are my children. Those who have opposed me are no longer in the mix at all. Future glory is what we're looking at. So let's look at Romans 8, 18. And he uses a mathematical term in here that has become a southern saying, well, reckon so, yeah, reckon so. Yeah, you want to meet over at the store? Yeah, reckon so. That's not what he's talking about. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay, hear what that just said. Take all of the worst crisis in your life that you have ever faced that you thought you were never going to survive and get out of and the ones that we yet have not faced. Paul's conclusion is there's no comparison between the stuff of this world, the pain of this world, the sorrow of this world, the tragedy of this world. There's nothing that even begins to come close to the glory that is going to be revealed in us through Christ in that day. So right now we shared a few praises at the beginning. Wait until then. You won't be able to turn it off. You're just going to keep, because for the first time, all of God's children together will truly understand what he has always been doing, what his intents always were. And at that point, we have to understand the suffering, and, and let me make a distinction here. The suffering I go through because I'm a knucklehead from time to time, uh, that's not godly suffering, okay? That's me doing the wrong thing. That's me making poor choices, bad decisions, and all of that. He's talking about suffering for the sake of the gospel, suffering for the sake of identification with Christ. And all of us of God's people have gone through that to one degree or another, and I've said it again and again. Of the institutions of our current world that we live in, the church is the last remaining thing that's standing. Education has been secularized and humanized. Law, politics, economy, basically all the stuff that we deal with every single day. And the last stronghold is God's institution, of the body of Christ, and the world is coming after it because they define us by the building. They define us by who can come in and what percentage and all that stuff. You, you know by now we've pretty much ignored all of this. Anybody not realize, realize that yet? To the degree that you are willing to be free, you are free. To the degree that you shackle yourself, because others want to shackle you, you will remain that way. And that's not a good place for us to go. So it's not just cutting loose and doing anything we want and endangering. Now, that's not what I'm saying at all. But as I pointed out earlier, the churches on the reservation are shut down. They are forbidden to meet. I have a sneaking hunch, though, there's probably a few out there that are still doing meeting anyway. I just have a sneaking hunch. But by and large, and I was just told this last week, no, we are still shut. We cannot open from the president on down. We simply can't. So what does that mean? That you just are waiting or are you finding other ways? to? Hey, how about if we start meeting in Farmington? They wouldn't know the difference because it's not the building. It's not the place. It's the people wherever they are. Okay, so what does this mean? First bullet, Paul reckoned. That means that he considered all things. He took all of the information and all the facts that he had, and he worked that out as a formula, as an equation. And the outcome was this world 
is not even worthy to be compared to what is to come. The sufferings of this world, no matter how horrendous they are, are not comparable to what God has in store for his people. And you know what? I reckon the same thing. I'm with Paul. I reckon so too. This world just doesn't compare with what God has planned for us. So the second group of verses. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now how we define the creature, I'm not going to get into all the alternatives. I'm going to approach it from the simple mind of just saying he means everything. Okay, I think it's more ex explicit than that, but there's no reason to even bring that issue up. It's basically saying that God has placed eternity in the hearts of all people. And there are a group of people who are waiting and waiting and waiting for eventually somebody to give them the way out of this mess. Say it another way. People are waiting to hear the gospel. They just don't know what to call it because they've never heard it. They know there's more, but they can't nail it down at all. In their worldly mind, they simply can't figure out what God's plan is. And so they wait earnestly. But I'm going to go ahead and expand it to include all of the physical universe and world for sake of our study today. What that basically means is this, your next bullet. Through the incarnation, that is God becoming flesh, Christ becoming human, through the incarnation, through the death, the actual death, he didn't just swoon on the cross, he wasn't passed out and they, you know, snuck his body away. Through the resurrection, which was not spiritual, but it was physical and it was real, and Jesus told Thomas, come over here and touch me and put your hand in. And what did he do? He dropped to his knees immediately. He said, my Lord and my God. He knew exactly who he was, but he had to have the proof. And Jesus said, fine, come over here and see for yourself. Also, in that resurrection, which was total and complete, deliverance has come. That's the key. Deliverance has come to all who will entrust their lives to Jesus. And I'll say it one more time. There are people waiting to be saved, but they don't know it yet. Wasn't that you and me once upon a time? It was prior to Christ. We, we were waiting for something. We didn't know what. And we were groaning and crying out even as a young child. That something's not right here. Something is broken here. And ultimately, somebody shared the gospel. And by God's spirit, you heard it and you were born again a new creature. Deliverance. He's not the deliverer of my headache, although I don't want to have a headache and I ask God to deliver me from the headache. And sometimes it's like, well, then take a couple aspirin, okay? Lay down. Deliverance in this setting is deliverance from death the wages of death, because we will die a physical death, but the wages of sin is death, eternal separation. That has been conquered. We all still have one more enemy that we must face, and that is death. That's the last enemy we all face, and yet Christ has conquered it because we know that this body must die so that the new one can come forth at the resurrection. And yet we don't quite understand that, do we? How does that work? And that always leads to the conversation of cremation. So if you want to have that, we'll one-on-one -on -one that, okay? We want to be delivered completely. And on your page, you can jot it on the, on the, on the backside. Most of you have heard this again and again. We will be saved spiritually because now we belong to Christ and his spirit dwells in us. 
we will be saved in our thinking, in our mind, because we now are being given the mind of Christ, which changes our worldview. We are being saved from our emotions so that all of us George Flighty people who like to react to everything, I know who you are. I know your names. He's going to deliver us from that. We're not going to be manic, depressive, crazy, <laughs> crazy people in eternity. We're going to mellow out and be exactly where we need to be. What's the fourth part? He's going to save us from this dying body and give us a new one. He's going to save us to the uttermost, completely. Complete forgiveness, complete salvation, new thinking, new heart, new body, new spirit. Everything is included in that deliverance. We're not having a partial order, and your um, you have been delivered love, but uh, patience is on back order, so it'll show up later. Anybody get those kind of deliveries at their door? From You have two-day delivery from Amazon that comes 10 days later? Yeah, okay. You get it then. We get the whole thing, all it, boom, it will be complete. Second part, as we wait for our eternal glory, that complete deliverance, that complete uh, finishing of God's work that cannot be compared to this world at all and the struggles and trials we all go through, as we wait for that eternal glory in Christ, the Holy Spirit will make the entire journey within us. He's always there. Sometimes we pray and we know not how to pray, but that's okay because the Holy Spirit within us knows the heart of God and prays the things that we don't know to pray. And it's not, it's not yabba-dabba-do stuff either. It's, it's internal. It is God who lives in us, who knows how to formulate what we can't. Right now, the other day, back with Pira, Pira is the youngest. She's a year and a, a couple months and I think Pira wants to come and play with Zeke sometime. I don't know. You guys will figure that out. And she's talking, except she's really not talking yet. Mom, mom. But she knows exactly what she's trying to get out. She just doesn't know how to say it yet. She's actually having a conversation with Grandma and Grandpa. And we're just going... More, more. <laughs> I can't, I can't. Now I'm beginning to hear the pitch of her voice. And the last thing that happened back before they drove off last night, the windows were down, the Danny and them have left, Nat's pulled out, she rolls the windows down, and Pierre goes, bye. She knows exactly. She just can't get it out yet. But it's coming. And it'll probably come out in paragraphs. When it does come out, <laughs> we go, whoa, 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 are you talking about a cartoon or your teddy bear or you just saw a squirrel run across the yard? What are you talking about? And it becomes a whole different level. The Holy Spirit is with you and me through the entire journey. journey. <laughs> Make enough words. <laughs> From the new birth to toddlerhood, I might as well keep making up words, right? through our childhood years spiritually, to our adolescent years. Can you imagine how God deals with spiritual adolescence? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> which means they say they're going to do one thing and do another, which means they always have a smart answer, which means they always know the parents are wrong and they know how to fix it. Can you imagine? That's a God who is amazing. Who It doesn't change him a bit. He goes, well, you got to go through that process. You'll make it to adulthood. Don't worry about it. In fact, you're going to make it to future glory. Just watch what I'm going to do. I will not fail. You will all grow up into the kind of people you were always intended to be. That's a journey, the entire journey. Through the times I trust, through the times I don't. Through the times I'm faithful, the times I don't. The times I believe, the times I don't. The times I'm... <laughs> overjoyed in the times I'm so filled with pain I can't even express it. He's there for the entire journey. 23, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we, ourselves, 
grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. Now, we're already adopted. We already looked at that last week or two. We are adopted. But it doesn't make sense to us yet because we have not yet been revealed as true sons and daughters of God yet. That will happen. We wait for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So when does that adoption come? He gave you the clue in the last part, at the resurrection. I love it. First bullet. This journey causes an intense longing within each one of us. It's, it's this deep desire that won't go away, keeps drawing us, keeps pulling us back. That may be the person that you know or we know or maybe we ourselves that we have wandered away a little too far and we cross this line that we don't know until we get there and we go, I don't think God can love me anymore. I don't, I don't think I can be forgiven anymore. I think I've been kicked out of the family. Ever been there? And yet because of that intense longing, the spirit within you is saying, no, 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 I will in no wise cast you out. No, no, I will never leave or forsake you. No, no, peace, be still. I'm always with you. Just, just, COVID's crazy, but hang on, it's just part of the ride, no big deal. Wait until the next one. We don't know what's coming next, but surely something else is coming. That's just how life works, right? This journey as we go through, it's an intense longing because we get a little taste of what it feels like to be free, and yet we're not completely free. We get a taste of what it means to be forgiven, and yet we question whether it's real. We get, we get a taste of God's mercy, and yet we don't see it in its fullness and completeness. We see little hints and clues along the way that we just cry out and go, man, I can't wait. I can't wait for this journey to end. And, and that's misworded because the journey began at your new birth, and it will never end. It will end in this world, but not in the world to come. It creates this intense longing, a spiritual groaning. What believer has not cried from the depths of their heart, begged God to understand this thing called salvation, to be free at last from this sin, whatever it may be, this world, to be free from our enemy Satan. That day's coming. We won't fight the world anymore. We won't fight sin anymore. We won't fight Satan anymore. It'll be done. And I can't wait. To which God says, tough, you got to wait a little longer because I'm not done yet, okay? So if I can keep that in the back of my mind, i got to go through this because God is not done. I cannot be selfish and try to just speed up the journey and go home because there have been times in my life I've wanted to go there. And then you look back and go, what does all this mean? And you go back and you start reckoning what you've been through and go, hmm, God's doing something big here. I better pay attention. 24 and 25, we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. That would take care of a lot of little promises books right there. Because you're looking for, here's my prayer and here's my answer, my prayer and my answer. Now, th- I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying you're thinking at a small level. Because most true prayers are eternal prayers and bigger than your whole lifetime and my whole lifetime. We're saved by hope, but hope that is seen. See, we want proof. God, prove to me you're God. Do this, do that, open this door, close that window, do that, do whatever it is. However we do this in our heart, we're trying to outthink God. We're trying to help him along our progress and our journey. And he says, I'm just not going to let you because I'm God and God alone and you aren't. And I love you more than you can imagine. I've forgiven you of everything that you cannot realize yet. My mercy never ends. I have plans that you can't even fathom 
what I am doing. It is that much greater and bigger. So I have hope in the eternal God. I don't have to measure it by what I see, what I feel, what I think. God is God alone. He's always on the throne. That's it. Period. If we hope for that that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. That's like God saying, using one of our own idioms, just hold your horses. I'm not done yet, okay? Just, just calm down a little bit. I'm using COVID to judge. And in the judgment, some of it is negative against unbelievers. And I will use it in my ways to try to draw people toward me. Within the body of Christ, I am using COVID to get your attention to show you, again, how far you've wandered off. And yes, some will die. And yes, some will be very ill. And many people will get the disease but not even know it and have no problem. I got a little headache. That's it. Because God uses everything for his purposes. He is using it to restructure our country in a way that I don't like one bit. But it's my country by citizenship. It's actually God's country. When he's done, it, it, he's done. So, so I want to be careful with this. Judgment is negative and positive. To those who don't believe, it has a negative outcome. For those who do believe, it forces us. Anybody been forced for the last 12 months? I've had a few embarrassing run-ins, but I try to keep them at a minimum. I try to just do a 22 caliber instead of a 20-gauge boat barrel <laughs> effect. And I bet you've been there too because we're tired and we're worn out and we've seen things messed with that shouldn't have been messed with and we've seen people go through horrendous stuff that, that uh, we're still trying to figure out what all that means. And we've seen others walk away. One out of three churchgoers 14 months ago are not going back. One-third of the structured body of Christ walked away. Now, did they totally walk away from Christ? No, they walked away from what we're doing here. Will God call them back if they're a true believer? Yes, in time. And they will... See, and we need to watch for that because I don't know if it'll come trickling back or it'll come back as a wave or, or what. We don't know. I just know that right now there are opportunities being given to us that we haven't really considered. And if we'll pay attention and just be praying, okay, God, so what? Can we have a little bit of direction here? And the first direction he will always give his people is wait and be still. I'm God. I'll move you when it's time to move. I'll show you when it's time to show you. Until then, put your hope in me. Do not trust in your own ways. Do not lean to your own understanding. If we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So this spiritual journey, second bullet, creates in us a hope. And hope is not wishful thinking in biblical language. It is a certain reality. It is, it is actual. It means it's a done deal, okay? This is not a what if or maybe so. It's not that at all. This spiritual journey creates in us a hope, a certainty that creates patience for the outcomes within the believer. Doggone mask. I'll probably still carry it for the rest of my life. I do change it out at least every three months. Depends on how many times I drop on it, step on it accidentally. I can do that because it really doesn't. If I go back and, and, and visit my childhood, all the stuff that all of us go through in life, if we'll just take what we've been through the last year as just one more piece of that journey, 
then it, then we can stop being afraid because that is the motivator right now. Understand what the unbelieving world is up to. Don't be fooled by it. Twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight. Like I said, all of these could be separate messages, every one of them. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our sicknesses, emotional, mental, physical, spiritual. All of that's infirmities, okay? The Spirit helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Oh, God, shouldn't he be the president? Oh, God, shouldn't do it? we? How, oh, God, how do we get rid of our governor? Can we do a swap? Can we, you know, what, what do we do? We just, we don't know. We really honestly don't know. And there, in, in any bad situation, there's good stuff happening. There really is. It's just hard to see because we get stuck on the bad. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit. This Now, okay, baby's gone. This will be a, so Mikey, you're going to have to do the hallelujah, okay? We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us. Always, 24-7, without fail. Groanings that cannot be uttered. He's not talking about some mysterious thing. He's talking about God who dwells within us by his spirit speaks God language. Human beings don't. So he knows what to call it. He knows how to measure it. He knows what should and shouldn't be done. And he intercedes. Now, just from a, a kind of a comical perspective, as I'm praying, and this is strictly comical, I can envision God's spirit saying, Tom, stop saying that. You don't know what you're praying. You don't know what you're talking about. Let me take over, okay? Because I know how to pray for you. I know what you need. I know what's coming next. I know where you've been. I understand all of it. So just surrender to me, and you're okay. And gosh, that is almost anti-American to do that, right? We are independent we, you know, we want to just fight back all the time. And, and that's actually probably a strength in the world, that ability. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God, not the will of Tom, not the will of a family, not the will of a generation, no. No. The Spirit intercedes on behalf of the will of God, on our behalf. So at that point, I have to even rethink through what praying is. Is praying me just asking for fix this, fix that, help me with that, help me with that? No, it's a whole lot more than that. Actual prayer takes us to the point of realizing God is God and I'm not. He knows what I need, and I don't. The Spirit knows the things of God, which I do not know, and he interferes with my prayers and causes my feeble attempt to talk to him as Pira. If I could translate Pira yesterday, I, 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 she's saying stuff, okay? I just can't put it in English yet. But that day will come, and that's kind of what's happening. That's us. I'm like I'm like the little granddaughter. I, I I keep having this conversation with God, but all the stuff that comes out of me is is mumbo jumbo. It just really, it's it's in my head. It's in my heart. It's just not coming out right, but it will. So we need to trust in Him. That bullet. This spiritual journey takes us through worldly weaknesses, and you can define that in all levels. Socially, economically, politically, religiously, physically, mentally. Just keep on going. This journey takes us through worldly weaknesses. 
it takes us on a journey through prayerful dependence on God. So I stop commanding God. I, n- I know that, Beck, I do practice selective hearing when the grandkids become demanding of Grandpa. And I just ignore them. Didn't hear a word you're saying. The louder they turn the volume up, the more I stop listening. Because <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. They don't. They're little kids. We can't have ice cream with chocolate syrup before we eat. Well, let's try it the other way, and then we'll see if we get there. Okay. We don't want to be little children praying as little children forevermore. We want to grow up and start praying about the battle and on behalf of other people as well as our own needs and struggles. All of it. All of it becomes legitimate through prayerful dependence so that we may learn and learn again and learn again and keep learning that he is faithful. He is a God who is willing He is a God who is able to completely save us. And he will. That's the outcome. That's the journey we're on. Less of me, more of him. None of me, all of him. That's where the outcome will end. Third piece. The outcome of our salvation will be complete conformity to the likeness of Jesus. Now, i got to throw in another word because conformity is correct on the one occasion. On the other, it is transformation. The conformity has to do with my relinquishing and surrendering and letting go. And the transformation comes as I do that. And as I am being transformed through the sanctification of my mind and spirit and body and all of that, the outcome is going to be I'm going to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. What I did not just say is we will be Jesus or we will be just exactly like him. No, what I am saying is we will be exactly who we should have been in the first place without sin, without death, without Satan, without this world. We will simply become who God intended us to truly be, conformed into his image. We won't have to learn to worship God. We will just simply do it. We won't keep fighting in heaven. I do think we'll keep learning, though, whatever that means. That's conformity. But when, when I go home and I stand before Jesus, I will be complete. And yet, that's that part of the journey just starting. And, and I can't really grab a hold of that right now because bad thinking kicks in, bad feeling kicks in, all this other stuff kicks in. And we twist it. Complete conformity. How does this work? And now we're getting into uh, predestination and all that. And I'm not going to go too far on that at all. I hope I can make a simple point of it. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he, meaning Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren, First bullet, the outcome of our salvation is to be with Jesus and like Jesus. What do you mean like Jesus? Well, we won't be so bratty anymore. We won't be so demanding anymore. We'll we'll have the fruit of the Spirit in its fullness. We'll have love for what it really is and peace for what it really is and patience and kindness and all, all of that stuff. All of that will be ours forevermore. It won't be a constant battle anymore. It will be a very glad, joyful relinquishing of who we think we are, which God says, but I know who you really are because remember, I made you, okay? Don't forget that. So we will be like Jesus in terms of 
how we view things, how we respond to things, how we think, how we act. Uh, no, no room for arrogance in heaven, okay? No room for self-pride or conceit or anything. We won't get in each other's way all the time. Anybody been doing that lately? <laughs> I try to not do it too much to the brethren, and I try to not harass Walmart too much, but it's a battle. I'll be like Jesus. I will bless them and thank them for guarding the door and keeping me safe and washing all the stuff that has nothing to do with anything and making sure the stock has been handled by every person under the sun and put right back on the shelf and come on. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> I made a mistake the other day. I took my cart back in by myself and I put the, un, the unsanctified cart with the sanctified carts and then I walked out and went, Okay, just, just be a good boy and leave it abandoned out in the middle of the parking lot so people can run over it, okay? Don't try to do the right thing and put it back. Just leave it alone. Come on, Beck, is that an amen? <laughs> Got to take you on the journey because I think you're all on the same journey. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And about the only thing I can say about the Calvinistic approach is this. God knows because he is eternal God, not bound by time and space, he's the creator of. He already knows who his children are. And yet it's not a forced compliance or a forced salvation. It's just his greatness and knowledge and grace and mercy is so much bigger. And the, and the closest we can get, and I think we're going to eventually hit it here a little bit further down in Romans, is a hypothetical discussion. What if, it's around Romans 10 going into 11, what if God had a bigger plan and he decided to make some pots of clay so that he could break them. Who are you to question that he does that? What if God decided to make some pots and adorn them greatly to put them up on the shelf so he could say, man, that's beautiful. Who are you to question? What if God made some pots just to throw trash and garbage in? Who are you to question what he's doing? He's the potter, we're the clay. He's just simply making a point. I and I alone am God. And I know what I'm doing. And in the end, everything is taken care of correctly. And those who chose vehemently, consistently to reject me, I reject them. And those who saw that I had a bigger picture in mind and weaving this tapestry throughout all of history in each and every life, they will know that they were the predestined. And they will know that they were the called. And they will know that they are justified completely and free of all their sin. And they will know that they will be glorified with Christ in a resurrected body. No more sin, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more struggling. No more bad days. No more groundhog loops. Oh, goodness gracious, are you kidding? Ultimately, we're going to know that through the new birth and ultimately the resurrection from the dead, that we will stand before God in that new and glorious body and go, oh, I get it. All to God's glory. And every knee will bow and drop. Forced compliance? Nope. Normal reaction. To be in the presence of God will bring us to our knees whether we think so or not. It will not be com compliance. It will not be forced. It's the same wording that was used of the Roman guard around the tomb. When they ask 
if he was the Christ. He said, I am, and immediately they fell to the ground. They're in the presence of God Almighty and don't even know it. And they couldn't help themselves but to fall flat. That's just every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And then a separation comes. So one way or another, even those who are destined at this point by their own unbelief to die in that unbelief, they too will kneel at the foot of Christ before they are cast out. And that's a sad day. It's a glorious day for God's people. It's a sad day because God says it was always going to come to this. I have spent all of history trying to save everybody, and they simply would not go there. And therefore, they are condemned by their own choice of unbelief, and they're simply getting what they've been asking for. And that's a simple way that I said that because I can't speak it the way God would speak it, of course. Everything will be justified. Everything will be done in righteousness. Final question, not on your sheet. How is God going to judge the world? Do you know the, verse, the, the scripture? God will judge the world through Christ according to the gospel, the good news. Those who accepted it, it's good news. Those who rejected it, what a mistake. Am I missing something? What am I missing, Dick? Okay, it's actually in the verse. It's contained in the verse. It's just, thank you. Those who come to the cross for salvation are predestined. Thank you, Beck, because that's the answer to Calvinism, Arminian discussion. Whoever comes to the cross becomes the chosen because Christ is the chosen. Whoever comes to the cross becomes the predestined because Christ is the predestined. Whoever is called, your second one, by the Holy Spirit through the gospel will hear because they hear with spiritual ears. They are justified by the cross of Calvary because their sins have been paid for through the blood of Christ. And they are glorified with Christ through the new birth and ultimately glorified in that future glory, which is the resurrection of the dead. Thank you. That was the summary statement of everything, wasn't it? So that's kind of important. So how do you know if you're predestined? Either you've accepted Christ or you're wrestling with it right now. And ultimately, God's Spirit will keep, uh, keep um, speaking to you internally. You need to let go and accept me. Stop making your own plans. Because, folks, every single time we make worldly decisions, we think we are doing the smart thing. And every time it bites us in the backside, every single time. So we make decisions economically based upon our pretty limited knowledge of how economics works. And we do everything right, and we say, well, if I can, if I can just do that, man, I'm going to save enough money to do this and do that. And it, never, it doesn't work out that way. Before this day is over, something will go wrong. It's already been going wrong. We can't talk right today, right? Because we're all tired. We're exhausted. <laughs> those, those who have been going through all of yesterday. We are in a good place to know that in this crazy 2020, 2021, and however long this keeps being prolonged, we're in a good place because future glory awaits us. But in order to get to the future glory, we've got to go through the junk first. So stock up on masks. If you're looking for a job, you could probably make them and sell them. And, you know. I still have some of my N95s that I got 10 of them for $5 a few years back, and I use them in the shop, and I could probably sell them for 5 bucks a piece right now. <laughs> and Chris, remember when we first started? I said, I bet you at today's black market price, We've got at least $400 worth of this stuff down in the basement on a shelf, which means two bottles. <laughs> yeah. 
It's crazy where we've been, but it's not going to be the last time. Remember, this is a sorting out. This is, this is, a, this is a calling. This is a crucible for us at this point in time. I don't know what our kids are going to do with, do with it when they grow up. I just don't know. I just remember what we went through as kids. Remember the uh, bomb scares we did every week at school? And you walked out of the building and you crouched and you put your coat over your head because that's going to save you from a nuclear attack. No, it's actually just drilling into you how to take care of a panic. I live in fear. So we need to understand this. For the kids, I'm very hopeful for your future because God is still God. He is not done yet. I'm convinced of that. He is calling back millennials back into his kingdom to be future leaders. They just don't know it yet. There are children who are going to accept Christ who have not yet made that journey, but they will. And God is consistent. I don't have to worry about it. I just have to let go and do what I'm supposed to do. And hopefully we can all figure that out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are God and you alone are God. And you are on your throne and you never have relinquished power. You never have uh, allowed somebody to take away from you who you are and, and what you are. Help us as we are coming out of a year plus of people just being scared to death every single day because of the way things are being handled. There are real health issues, but it's also being used to manipulate. And help us to not be filled with fear every single day. Help us to see the inconsistencies of policies and practices that are absolutely creating a lot more damage than the enemy itself that we think we're fighting. Help us to see in your through your eyes what's going on around us. Not, not in an arrogant way, not in a way that just puts us in fighting mode because it's easy to get there, but in a way that we can see wisdom in what is happening, that you are through all of this struggle. You're, you're opening another chapter. And we pray for our kids, and we pray for our grandkids, and we pray for our young families that have had a world turned upside down on them, not just in this country, but throughout the entirety of the human race right now. And help us to find grounding in the cross of Christ, and help us to find hope through the resurrection of Christ. Help us to let go of our own self-control and how we think we're going to fix it. And just allow certain things to play out, because they will in the end. And you will still get all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, Stan, sing one more with us just before we go today. I came to you with my heart in pieces. Found the God with healing in his hands. Turned to you everything behind me found the God who makes all things new I look to you drowning in my questions found the God who holds all wisdom I trusted you stepped out on the ocean caught my hand among the waves you're the God of all my days. Step by step, you make a way. I will give you all my grace. My seasons change. It stays the same. You're the God. from you, wandered in the shadows, found a God who relentlessly pursues, hid from you, haunted by my failures, found the God who's 
grace still covers me. I fell on you when I was at my weakest. Found the God, lifter of my head. I worship you, dealt you right beside me. You're the reason that I sing. You're the God of all my days. Each step I take, you make a way. I will give you all my praise. My seasons change, you stay. I worry, God, you are my stillness. In my searching, God, you are my answer. In my blindness, God, you are my vision. In my bondage, God, you are my God, you are my freedom. Oh, you're the God of all 